morning, everybody. We pray and trust that you had a good night's rest on last night and that you have uh, awakened this morning with the goal in mind to give God the glory, the honor, and the praise that is so rightfully his. Yeah. Uh, just want again, just it might remind us if there's anybody at the house uh, that's not yet uh, in order, let's get them in order uh, so that we can uh, give God just uh, the integrity and in praise that he deserves. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's 27 weeks that we're doing what we're doing now, and I know that there's the ability for complacency to set in, for laziness to set in, uh, to kind of come to a point that I, I really don't care. Uh, but remember, God is he's so much more deserving than that. Uh, he, he deserves our best at all times, even though these times are different than what we have been used to for all of our lives, all of our lives, oh God, yeah. uh, but God deserves our best. Yes, and so please, let's not be lackadaisical. Let's not be in any way um, disconnected. Uh, let's, let's do it because, you know, here, here is the reality. We, we definitely wouldn't want God to treat us sometimes like we treat him. Oh, Lord. We God. wouldn't want him to be disconnected from us. We would not want him to be disinterested in us. Uh, we would not want him to be lazy about us. So let's not do that to him because he deserves all yeah, the glory, yeah, yeah, yeah. all the honor, and all the praise. So come on, let's join in in giving God what belongs to God. Uh, our praise team is going to lead us in song. Our brothers are going to lead us in our devotional time. And then we're just going to move forward in our worship of him today. Remember, there's an audience of one, yeah, yeah. and it's God. Yeah. And so it's not an issue of you being impressed. The issue is, is that you giving God the praise and honor that he so rightfully deserves. Thank you for being in with us this morning. Let's join in in praise of our God. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. 
Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life in many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Mm. This will bring help to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, Mm. with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, (laughs) and your vats will brim Ah, over with new wine. My My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke, right. because the Lord disciplined those he loves yeah. as a father, the son he delights in. Yes. Blessed are those who find wisdom, yeah. those who gain understanding, yes. for she is more profitable yes. than silver yes. and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Yes. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. Yeah. In her left hand are riches and honor. Uh. Yeah. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. Mm -hmm. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast Mm -hmm. will be blessed. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, Father. which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, God, our daily bread. Forgive us our debt as we forgave our debtors. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. The glory is forever, everlasting, and thou art God today. O oh God, we come to you at this time in the name of Jesus Christ. Coming now, God, to say thank you, thank you for your goodness, for your kindness, you. for your tender, loving care. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. O oh God, thank you for last night while we slept in our bed. O oh God, and early this morning, O oh God, you saw fit to wake us up one more time in our right mind with our health and our strength. Thank you, God, for giving us a mind to come to the house of worship. Oh, here we are this morning, God. Come and call upon you, your name, God. Because you are the only one that we can call on. You know our heart, Lord. You know our mind. You know what we need, I pray. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this day, oh God. Thank you for this Sunday morning, oh God. We come to worship and praise you, God. We come corporately together to praise your most wonderful name. For you deserve all of the praise. Oh, God, bless us this morning, oh, God. Bless those that's in the house of worship. Bless those that are at home listening. Bless those that may be driving the automobile, oh, God. But bless everybody this morning. Because, Lord, we know that you is able. Everything is about you, God. It's not about us, I pray. But it's all because of you, God. Because you gave your only begotten son. 
to give that we might have a right to the tree of life. Since he rose early this Sunday morning, oh, oh God, we come here on Sunday morning to worship you corporately. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. We thank you, oh God, for this privilege we're having right now. Thank you for the Good Shepherd Church, oh God. Keep us in your care. Hold us in your hand. Let it be the people of God that you call for us to be, I pray. Bless our pastor, it is your will. Him to continue to do your will, I pray. We know that you're giving him a responsibility, oh God. And oh God, have him to continue to trust in you, I pray. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. Bless Pastor Tim, I pray. Oh, bless our deacon staff. Bless our uh, nurses, staff, everybody, oh God. As a whole, oh God. Bind us together, oh God. So of time we can, may not see each other, oh God. But Lord, we know that you're able, oh God. You see and you know everything. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. Come and pray for the sick everywhere. Oh, God, people need you, my Father. Can't get along without you, oh God. We pray for those that don't know in the pardon of their sins. Touch them in the name of Jesus. And then, God, we pray for your sins everywhere. Let us live a life, oh God. Let our lives so shine, my Father. And men may see our good work and, and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Oh, Lord, we need to lift you up, oh God. Everywhere we go, we need to let the world know that you're real and you're the real God, I pray. Oh, have mercy, Lord Jesus. Keep us, oh God. Bless us this morning. Bless the one who preach your word, oh God. Give him preaching power, I pray. Not only in Good Shepherd, but the churches everywhere. Oh, have mercy, God. All over the world, oh God. People calling upon your name, God. You're the only one, I pray. We continue to trust in you, God. In the midst of everything else, oh God, let us hold on to your unchanging hand. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. You are able, oh God. We love you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. Give God the praise that he deserves. We're going to sing now for our babies. We ask that you gather the children, and we're going to let everyone know that God loves us. Yeah, yeah. He made us, and he loves us. Come on, children, put your hands together. Come on.
showed his love on Calvary when he died for you and me. Yeah, yeah. He loves us. And he rose again. Thank you, God. Come on now.
Yes, he lived. I believe he got up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got up in you. Yeah. He got up in you. Yeah. He got up in us, and we are thankful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankful today that he got yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I need the old I need the and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants who the master, when he comes, will find watching. Surely I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if it should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. 
Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, who, is, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and the female servants and to eat and to drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom, every, to whom much has been committed to him, they will ask the more. Just to title the text today, we want to use as a subject, the Lord is coming back. It's that simple. The Lord is, the Lord is coming back. Would you, would you do this uh, if you're around your family, especially uh, sitting where you are at your table or it might be in your living room, wherever you may be, or hopefully none of you sitting in your bed. Um, but could you just turn to a neighbor and say, neighbor, the Lord is coming back. Mm -hmm. Say it one more time. They look like they didn't believe you. Say it one more time. The Lord, the Lord is coming back. You know, it's it's one of those it's one of those issues that uh, many of us as believers don't really want to talk about. It's not something that we're totally comfortable with uh, because the reality for us is that the Lord is coming back. Uh, the question is, what what will He find us doing when He returns? That's that's the question. During, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic since March of 2020, if the Lord had to come back during this season, uh, the question for us would be, what would he find us doing? H how would he find us thinking? What would he hear us saying? What would be our attitude about what's he is allowing to take place because the reality for all of us is that we must live this life with the motivation that the Lord is coming back. As a matter of fact, it ought to be the greatest motivation for us. When we think about it, the Bible says that we have been saved from the penalty of sin uh, Romans 6 reminds us of that. We, we are being saved, uh, if you will, from the power of sin, but we believe that we will one day be saved from the presence of sin. And the only way that we can be saved from the presence of sin, it requires that the Lord comes back. And so, Every one of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ ought to live daily. We ought to live moment by moment with the expectation of the Lord's return. And on the basis of the scripture that we're looking at today that has been written by Luke, who is considered the only Gentile writer of the scriptures, Luke helps us to understand just as all of the prophets did, just as all of the other apostles did, all of those authors of the scripture did, he reminds us that there is what is known as the day of the Lord. There's a day of reckoning. There is a day where God again has created everything that he has created, but he has declared that he's going to bring everything back to himself and all of the order that he intended in the beginning that he set forth with Adam and Eve in the garden, all of the order that he intended then is going to be established at what we call the kingdom of God. 
And that's going to come a time, things as we see them as they are. When we look at the chaos that is in our world, that chaos is going to be removed. We look at the sickness of our world, that sickness is going to be gone. The death that we deal with, disease that we deal with, all of the things that are part of the human experience, it's all going to be gone, but it requires that the Lord returns. It requires that he comes back. And the good news is that we, we look at God's word and we find that when Luke writes, Luke writes somewhere around, uh, around the 60s, if you would say AD 60s, it's in the year of our Lord 60s, and no domina in the year of our Lord 60s. He writes, but he writes a narrative of something that has already happened some 30 years before he wrote it. By the time that Luke writes in the 60s, there are things that have been established by the Apostle Paul that helps us to understand uh, a little bit better the insight in terms of the Lord's return. Because we do know that there are two different events when we talk about the return of the Lord. We refer to that as the day of the Lord or the second coming. But there's also a day that we know as the rapture, and that is the day when the Lord comes to take his church out of the world. And so it's important that when we study the Bible that we understand that there is a distinction. But So when Luke writes, Luke writes already knowing the things that have been written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, that have been written by James. He is aware of those things that have already been said by the New Testament writers, the New Testament apostles. But 30 years after Jesus goes back up to the Father, he now gives an account of the things that Jesus did and said that would help to understand the things that we read from Paul, the things we read from John, the things we read from James, the things we read from Jude, were an extension of what the Lord taught while he was on planet earth. In other words, he had to now discipline himself not to write about the church and the, the rapture of the church, but he had to write about what was called the parousia, the per parousia uh, that we often refer to as the second coming of Jesus Christ. But he gives us in that, some principles that we can follow all throughout the scripture that were given by the Lord, that were given to the apostles, that helps us to understand in a more expanded way what takes place as far as the gospel of Jesus Christ is concerned. So, so when you think about it, we think about it uh, right now, uh, today, more than likely this afternoon, there are some of us who are going to watch um, uh, uh, some football games and the like. And one of the things that is prolific in, in passing now is on well, football is the issue of the passing game. But there was a time whereby there was no passing in football. There was a time whereby they just ran with the ball. But, but some years ago, it was determined that they would start what was called a passing game and when the passing game was invented it was something that was absolutely new something that was absolutely fascinating it was something that literally revolutionized the game of football and now they have different ways that they do it you got the prolific quarterbacks you've got all the schemes and the like that they run but the reality is it all extends from the origination of the passing game and so today what we look at the things that we know about the church are extended from the things that Jesus taught his disciples while they were here and that's the thing that Luke will help us to understand just a little bit better but when you think about it in scripture we hear about the Lord's return and you know we used to play a game as kids it was called ready or not here I come you know hide and go seek are you ready uh, sometimes right now, Corey and I like to play that game, but Corey don't want to play the right way. Uh, Corey is the one that always wanted. She don't want you to necessarily go find her. So it was always one of them things that you got to go hide and then she's got to find you. But when it's her turn, she don't play right. She don't want to go and hide and that sort of thing. You know, so she messed me up with that game a lot of times. But the reality for us is that we have the promise that Jesus will return. Y'all, he's coming back. And ready or not, He's coming back. 
Ready or not, he's coming back. Paul, Paul reminds us of that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For you are our glory and joy. He says it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 at verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He talks about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at verse number 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, we have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves perfectly know that the Lord so comes, what, as a thief in the night. James, James writes it in James chapter 5. He says, therefore, be patient at verse 7. Brethren, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. 2 Peter chapter 3 at verse 10, he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away in a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and the, ele uh, and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. And even John the Apostle, the beloved of Jesus, says, and now little children, in 1 John chapter 2 at verse 28, he says, abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So the word of God is reminding us we've got to abide in God's word. We've got to obey God's word. I heard it in the song that was written to the children that we sung today, that when we read in his word, we find that God, what he cares for us, but we also read in his word that he could come at any time. So when we go back to Luke chapter 12, one of the first things that I want to share with you as it relates to the fact that the Lord is coming back is be ready for the inevitable return. That's the first thing. You got to be ready for the inevitable return. Be ready for the inevitable return. What do I mean by that? He, it, it, the, the word inevitable means it's incapable of being avoided. It is certain. It is sure. It is destined. It is foreordained. So he says, be ready for the inevitable return. Uh, some, some people would say, man, the Lord been talking about he coming back for 2,000 years, and he ain't came back yet, but that don't mean he ain't coming. The Bible, the Bible is really showing us he's trying to give some of us some chances. And he's giving us chance after chance after chance after chance. Listen, every time you wake up in the morning, is a reminder that the Lord has given you another chance. <laughs> you lay down that night and get up in the morning, it's a reminder that the Lord is giving you another chance. But also remember, every time you wake up could be the day that the Lord returns. And so the question beckons, what are we waiting for? So Jesus lays it out in a parable. He's been doing some wonderful teaching in the book of Luke, just a lot of different things that he's been teaching. One of the things that he was concerned about in chapter 12 was the whole issue of hypocrisy. And it was really the whole issue in terms of the Pharisees. The, the, they, it's not like they were playing church. Their problem was they thought they were church. And, and, they, and in them thinking that they were church, they thought they were more saved than what they were. And so reality, in reality, they lived out the lack of salvation that they had. So in, sight of, in light of the fact that they lived out that salvation that they thought they had, which was not according to the word of God, God called them hypocrites. 
because they thought they were living a certain way that was not in alignment with the word of God. So one of the things that Luke writes in chapter 12 is to warn against hypocrisy. And then he warned against the issue of stuff, holding on to things too tightly. He reminds us that wherever your heart is, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. In other words, whatever is most important to you, that's what you give your money to. That's what you give your time to. That's what you give your thought to. So he was giving them some warnings. He was reminding them the most important thing that you can do as a believer is to what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added unto you. Notice he didn't say seek a career. He didn't say seek a job. He didn't say seek a husband. He didn't say seek a wife. He didn't say seek having children. He didn't say seek having stuff. He said seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of them other things will be added unto you. And so he gets to uh, chapter, uh, uh, right at verse 29, uh, he reminds them again of the sign concerning Jonah. He gave them the parable of the lamps and the importance again of, 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 of being uh, anticipating, if you would, his return. When he comes to, to chapter 40, to chap verse 42, that is the issue now that Jesus is now wanting his disciples to understand. When he comes to that, to that, to that issue again in, in, in verse um, um, 40, I'm sorry, verse 41 or verse 35, he said, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. So what he was helping them to understand that now that you are my disciples, one of the things you already know that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi talked about the return of the Lord. They talked about the coming of the Lord. So it is important that in your life you also remember he would say to those that Jesus was teaching at that time who were his disciples, he was saying to them, don't forget that the Lord is coming back. So he says, but let your ways be girded and your lamps burning. That was a good, that was a good illustration that he was giving there. Basically, because, you know, in those days, everybody basically wrote loose, loose clothes. They wore robes and they had tunics underneath. But whenever someone was laboring, whenever somebody had to do some work or if they even had to run, they would literally lift up that robe and then they would take what was called a girdle or a waist belt and they would tie that around them so that the loose clothing that was, that was fitted loosely would now a little be a little closer to them. So now they were ready to do the work. So he says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. In other words, you remember the story of the ten virgins. Some were wise and some, some five were wise and five, five were foolish. They allowed, they didn't bring any oil in their lamps. And so therefore, when the bridegroom returned, guess what? They were not ready because they did not bring oil with them. And so that oil was normally in some kind of container. The oil was flowing in there. They had a wick on it. And they had to always be trimming that wick in order that that light, that lamp, could always be burning. So what he was saying now is why you do that. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding feast, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Is the description again of a man who's getting married. And you all remember that tradition that he talked about when he would get married, he would build his house and then he would have his servants and then he would go to get his bride. And the, but the issue was it normally he got his bride at nighttime and they didn't know, the servants didn't know when they would actually return, if you will, from the honeymoon or they would actually return back to the house with the wife. But what he was doing was applauding and recognizing those servants that were waiting for the master's return, they were the ones that were rewarded. They were the ones that were applauded. They were the ones that were, for, that were recognized because they were diligent enough to be waiting for the master when he returned. 
So, so he's just given us a description that Jesus has gone away. He said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you, right? And when I go to prepare, I'm going to what? I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. So he's reminding us that to be ready for the inevitable return. So what does he tell us? That basically the three things he's saying, you be, be anticipating it. You ought to be waiting for Jesus to come back today. I can't see most of you all right now. How many of y'all ready for him to come today? Oh, praise the Lord. Some hands went up, others didn't. He's like, oh, I, I don't know. I know he's coming back, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready. The question is, why not? So he is saying, since he knows he's coming back, he's saying make the preparation. So we ought to be anticipating it. The other thing to understand is that when the Lord come back, we will be reward, awarded for it. Again, notice what he said. Blessed are those servants whom when the master, when he comes, will find watching. Or surely I say to you, he will gird himself. Oh, my goodness. Now, again, Jesus is saying some things that would just normally would not happen in that culture. We're talking about the master of the house who has servants in his house, people that are under his employ, that when he returns from this wedding feast that he celebrated, he would literally say to his servants, because he is so appreciative for the fact that they were awaiting his return, he is saying to those servants, y'all sit down and I'm going to serve y'all. Yeah, how many times does your boss do that for you? He was literally saying to them, y'all sit down. I'm going to take care of everything else. Why? Because I am so appreciative for the fact that I told you I was leaving. But now that I've come back, you are living your life as though you were ready and waiting for the day when I would return. So now I'm going to award you for waiting until I return. So he says, not only that, he says, be, be, be aware you can't time it. First of all, he says, be anticipating it, be awarded for it, and then be aware you can't time it. Look at verse 39. He says, he says, but know this, and he gives another analogy now. If the master of the house had known that hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Wow. So he's given another analogy of, again, because notice what, what the, the point is in verse 40. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour. You do not, what? Expect. How many times have we heard through the years, there are many of us who are old enough to know that there have been folk who have been predicting when the law was going to come back? That's some of the craziest things. And man, people have done some ridiculous things in anticipation of the Lord's return. Some folk thought it was going to be Y2K. I mean, just doing all kind of crazy stuff that didn't make no kind of sense, none whatsoever. And some of them still spending money on that now, you know, because anticipating something that the Lord said, you don't know the hour that he's coming back. He could show up at any moment. So don't even try to time it. So what he does, he uses the analogy of a thief who comes to your house. Now watch this. If a thief were to call you and say to you, listen. Thursday morning, by 3 o'clock or 3, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to be breaking in your house. All right? I'm breaking in. I'm coming in. I'm getting your television and your, um, your computer, your uh, cell phone, uh, those games that y'all play, Michael and Daniel. I'm, I'm taking your stuff. What you going to do? Oh, yeah, you, oh, yeah, you're going to say, oh, well, come on then, you know, come on then. Those of y'all really bad, got your gun ready and all that, come on then. But a thief don't tell you. Thief don't tell you when you come. You know, one of, one of, the, one of the things that, 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 and I'm not telling folk don't have it, but now some of y'all got, y'all got that fancy uh, uh, equipment that uh, y'all can see the thief. But notice it don't stop them. They, they put the put the mask on. They cover their head, and they they take and you watch them take all the stuff out your house. And you, hey, you, hey, you just, stop! Don't do that. I'm telling you, the thief don't let you know. Don't let you know. They don't let you. Know. They don't let you know when they're coming. And Jesus is saying it's the same idea. I'm not telling y'all when I'm coming. All you need to do is I'm coming and you need to be ready when I come. 
So don't try to time it. If I could say this, there are some people who live like this, you know, say, hey, when I get older, I'm a, don't, don't time it like that. You know, you know, after I done sown my wild oats, I'm a, don't time it like that. You don't know when the Lord is going to come back. So we, but we do know that his return is inevitable. And so, and so, and so Luke would apply that to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You and I, who are part of the church, we would understand that from the standpoint of the rapture of the church. And in both cases, we don't know when the Lord is actually going to return. Yeah, we do know when he's talking to the Jews, we, know, we understand that it was under the time, uh, the prediction of the tribulation and the great tribulation, the three and a half years. But even at the end of that three and a half years, to know exactly what day that's going to be and exactly what time that's going to be in that day, no one knows. Jesus even declared when he was here on planet earth, nobody knows but the father. Nobody knows but the father. So the first thing again is to be ready for the inevitable return of the Lord. The second thing is be resolute as you wait. Be resolute as you wait. R-E-S-O-L-U-T-E. Be resolute as you wait. And that word resolute means to be marked or characterized by determination. You need to have, we need to have a determination to be obedient to God to wanting to do his will while we wait on his return. So one of the things that we've got to understand, verse 42 and verse 40 to 44 would actually say, be apt as a servant. Be apt as a servant. That means to be keenly intelligent and responsive. That means to be suited for the purpose that God has given you to be apt. You need to be apt as a servant. So now he is raising the analogy. Why? Because of what Peter asked the question in verse 41. In verse 41, Peter said, uh, Lord, do you speak this parable unto us or to all people? Well, when Peter said that, who was there? Go back to chapter 11 for just one moment. Just one moment. Go back to chapter 11. Look at verse 52. It says, Woe to the lawyers, for you have, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who, in, uh, who were entering you hindered. And as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might say that they might accuse him. So now we've made a determination. Who was there? The lawyers were there. These were the people that would transcribe the word of God. And these were the folk who would tell folk to do the very things that they were not doing themselves. Kind of sound like some of the folk in Congress, doesn't it? They tell folk to do things that they are not doing themselves. But they were the lawyers, if, if you would, of that time. And then look at chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable watch multitude, many scholars believe this is the largest crowd that Jesus ever taught, multitude of people had gathered together, so they trampled one another. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. So now, Peter, go back to chapter, chapter verse 41. Peter asked the question, uh, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or for all people? So now, notice what Jesus, how Jesus answered. He doesn't answer with an answer. He actually answered with another parable. He says, the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? Now, there, there's an indication there. If he's saying faithful and wise steward, that would be an indication of a disciple. This would be an indication of one who is a follower of Jesus Christ. Who Now, notice how he describes him. He says, uh, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give him that portion of food in due season. In other words, in those days... Uh, and I know one of the one of the things that 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 messes us up in our country is that we saw just the the wrong oppression of slavery in a way that it never should have been done. It was inhumane. It was wrong. It was evil. It was sinful to just all high heaven. It was nothing right about it at all. 
But in the time of Jesus, for most of part of the, the, the history of the world, slavery has always existed. There have always been servants. And this, in this word, that word servant would be, a, a, another word would be slave. And this was the person who was a doulos. This person was literally owned by their master. So now, but one time, what, but what would happen is that within that, 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 that mixture of the servants and slaves, there were some who would rise to the point that the master would give them greater responsibility, and it was to oversee all of the other servants that lived in the house. It's kind of, it would be no different than a, an employment where you start on the level of everybody else in your, on your job and then at some point you are what? You are given a promotion. Or it would be like in a classroom setting where all of the students are in the same classroom, but then there is a student in the classroom that has the response, a greater level of responsibility, whether it's for the day, whether it's for the week, whatever it may be. That person rises to the point that the master or the teacher now gives that individual greater responsibility. So now he said that is a wise servant who's now been given the responsibility, watch this, of giving the rest of the servants food at the appointed time that the master has determined. In other words, the master has determined that there's a certain level of work that needs to be done throughout the day. And when that work is completed, now it, it could be lunchtime or it could be dinner time, whatever it may be, it could be supper time. They were appointed to make sure that they had their food at that appointed time. So now notice how he describes it. He says to give them their portion, the food in, in due season. Blessed is that servant. I like that language. Why? This is the, the he says that the, the person that is apt to, uh, this, this apt servant, this person who is apt to do the right thing, this person that has been suited for the purpose. He says, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. So what he is saying, that this person who takes the, 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 the initial responsibility that was given by his master, he now is given more responsibility. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It makes sense. Why? So, so now he is, he is given another illustration of what to expect when one goes away and then he returns. But you always know that's going to always be some joker. That's not going to do the right thing, right? And so now he says, he got to he say, be resolute as you wait. And he's saying that to us. He'd be apt as a servant. But watch this. Here's the other thing. You got to be anti-selfish and slothful. Be anti-selfish and slothful. Watch this. Look at verse 45. He says, but if that servant says in his heart, same person, that servant says in his heart, uh, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and the female servants and to eat and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now, because remember, Peter did ask the question, Lord, are you talking about us or are you just talking about everybody? Now Jesus is answering that question. In the, in the, in the first parable, in verse 42 to verse 44, he's, he refers to one what as a faithful servant. But remember, in that audience, you still got them Pharisees and lawyers in that audience too, right? So now he's giving another parable, he's not, he's, and, but he's saying that same person, because here's what, what, God, what, what he's showing, that when we talk about the kingdom of God, we talk about people being in the presence of Jesus Christ, there were some who were pretending to be part of the kingdom. They were pretending to be Jews. They were pretending to be loyal to God. They were pretending to, to, to be a part of the, the nation of Israel. And Jesus knew that they had wrong attitudes. Now, can I, can I just say this? Don't assume that just because you come to church, That you saved. Let me say that again. Don't assume 
just because you come to church that you're saved. I'm going to say it again. Don't assume. I don't know who's listening to me right now. Just because you come to church, just because your name is on the roll, just because you say you're a member of a local congregation, don't assume that you're saved. Because, because sometimes our life will prove who we really are. Our life, the fruit of our life proves who we truly are. The fruit of our life proves our real character. The fruit of our life, the words that come from our mouth prove who we truly are. And I can say all day long I'm a Christian. But, but if the fruit of being a Christian doesn't show up, and it's a possibility I'm, I'm, I'm fooling myself. I'm, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I'm pretending to be something that I'm truly not. So Jesus says, but if that servant has the attitude in the mind, look, hey, the master, the master delay ain't coming. Shoot, he ain't coming back. Because here, here's, here's the reality. Jesus, God was right there in the flesh before them. And they were rejecting him. He was right there in the flesh before the Pharisees, many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the lawyers and the people, the leaders of that day, and they were rejecting the Lord who was right there in front of them. And so, and so the attitude there was, you're acting like the master hadn't come. But God had actually come in their presence. And here's what he's given the parable. He is this, this, this servant who's been given greater responsibility and now want to, beat the, want to beat the other servants. Want to mistreat them, want to abuse them, want to do them bad. Kind of sound like me. Yeah. I, I lived at 74 to Caddo with, uh, in the house with Charlene and Sienna. And because I was the oldest child, my mama, daddy would give me the responsibility and, um, and sometimes rather than doing what I should have done, I have to admit then, I was a bully. I was a bully. Sienna would attest to that. I was a bully. I'm being true. And I would demand, y'all going y'all gonna, to y'all gonna do such and such, and y'all going to do so and so. And if you didn't, yeah, a few times I put my hand on them. I, oh, y'all going to do this. And uh, my darker skin color, sister, uh, I ain't going to say her name. It's like she didn't take it. It's like, oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no. So, 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 there have been a couple of times that was a rumble in the jungle at 74 2 Keto, man, because uh, the big bully been given orders by mom and daddy what to do, but I wasn't necessarily doing what I should have been doing. But I'm going to demand, oh, y'all going to clean this room, and y'all going to do it right now. I must admit that was sometimes that mama came home and my work was not done. And I got punished for it. I got whippings for it. I got, yeah, and then she told daddy the same thing. And so what he's saying is that there's, there's this attitude of the servant that would come and then the master would return and find that the work was not done. And what he's literally saying to those leaders of that time, he's saying for those leaders of that time, those of you that think you got it going on, those of you that think that you are part of the kingdom of God, those of you that think you are descendants of Abraham, those of you that think you are automatically in the kingdom because you are an Israelite or because you are a Jewish person, he's saying you're going to be cast in the outer darkness. Matthew 24 would say that that's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what it's saying to us, folks, that there is the reality that within our own confines, that can be those of us who are faithful to God, who want to do what God says, but that there can also be those of us who are fake shaking it. And God is saying, I'm going to deal with any one of you because I'm coming back and I'm coming back at any time, whether you plan or not, I'm coming back at any time. So, so the, the challenge for us is to be faithful to the things that God has called for us to do. So he reminds us, he says, he says first of all, you got to be apt as a servant. Don't be, be, be anti-selfish and slothful. Slothful mean lazy. I, I must admit that as a pastor, I'm very concerned right now. 
It's been 27 weeks since I've actually physically seen some of you all. And I got some concerns right now, whether or not you're getting complacent, whether you're getting lazy, whether you're getting lackadaisical, because the reality is that the proof of you being a Christian is not whether or not you come to this building. The proof that you, you are a Christian is what you do in the building that God already lives in. And so I've got some concerns as a pastor right now. And I'm just wondering, Lord, are your people still praying? Are your people still reading the scriptures? Are your people still doing their best on that job? Just because we haven't been coming together, it's, it's not a time for us to get lazy and lackadaisical and complacent. Because guess what? The Lord could return during this COVID-19. And what will we tell him when we look at him in the face? So I'm saying to us, don't, don't, don't be like this servant. Don't. Don't, don't, don't change your attitude about God. That fervency that you used to have about service, you can still serve because everywhere you turn, somebody is looking for volunteers to help give some food, give the help, give some supplies. Somebody is looking for somebody to help and do something. If you don't know what to do, just think about somebody, put them some food together and drop it off at that door. You got to stay serving. I'm concerned as a pastor. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. That, that, that because the Lord, the Lord looked like we're having this delay in returning to the building that some of us are just kind of whatever. God does not want us to have that whatever attitude. Because he could come back at any time. He is more deserving, y'all. He is, he is wonderful. He is good. He is gracious. He is kind. He keeps waking us up in the morning. He keeps supplying all of our needs. Or oh, it gets short every now and then. But he's got a way of making up for that shortness. I'm saying to us, don't get lazy. Don't get lackadaisical. Don't, 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 don't forget that you still accountable because he is sovereign. Look at verse 47 and I'm done. He says, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will will be, meet, be meet, beaten with many stripes. Meaning that we are accountable to God. Whether we are believer or not a believer, we are accountable to God. Man, when you look at what's going on in our world right now, we got a whole lot of reminders that somebody is up to something. All of these tropical storms, all of the, the hurricanes that have been going on, we got a reminder that there's somebody greater than us that's in control. He said that servant who knew his master's will in verse 48 and did not prepare himself to do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Now watch this. He's not talking about us as believers. No, no, no. He's not talking about us as believers. This is for unbelievers. This, all, this is for the folk who would be in the church who claim to be a Christian, but you live like something else. That's what an unbeliever does. Listen, folk, it's an it's a easy, easy thing to be on your P's and Q's for two hours a week when you're around other folk that want to do God's will. But the reality is, what are we doing that other than 166 hours when nobody but the Lord is seeing what we're going on? Don't fool yourself into believing you're a believer and you're not a believer because what he is saying, that's going to be a levels of judgment even for the unbeliever. Then he brings it all back together. In verse 48 in closing. He says this, we ought to be reaching your full potential as God requires. Be reaching your full potential as God requires. Look at the end of verse 48. He says, and for everyone, the B clause of verse 48, to everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. In other words, what you got to understand, whatever it is that you have, it's because God gave it to you. But whatever it is you have that God gave, it, gave to you, God requires that you use it responsibly. Because one day, you got to give back to God what he gave to you. Am I making sense here, folks? 
One day we got to give back to God what belongs to God. I know what some of y'all say, hey, you know, what, what you mean the Lord gave it to me? The Bible says this, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Everything I got belongs to God. And one day I have to give an account to God for what he gave. So, so watch this, watch this. And I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it this way. I'm going to end it this way. Uh, basically what he's talking about when it, come, when, it come, when it comes to the issue of requirement, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, it is required of the steward that one be found faithful. In other words, whatever it is that God has given us, God wants us to be faithful, to use what he's given him, what he's given us for his glory. Whether it's people or whether it's possessions, he wants us to use it for his glory. Whatever level of responsibility that God has given us, whoever we are, God has given us a certain level of responsibility in what we do. How, or, or, or he's given us the, the, the charge, if you will, to do what he said do with what he has given us. All right, so here's what I need y'all to do. Uh, this is going to take a little time, but I, need us, I, need, I, need, I actually need everybody to turn to these passages. First Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, this is for the elders. 1 Peter chapter 5. If you don't do them all right now, just write, at least write the passages down. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. This is for the pastors, the elders of the church, the leaders of the church. It says, to the elders who are among you, I exhort, uh, who am a fellow elder, this is Peter, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also the partakers of the glory that will be revealed. Watch this. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseas, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, he will receive, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. He's not only saying this to the elders, but he also says something to the deacons. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. If you don't, if you don't turn to it, make sure you write it down and you can read it later. 1 Timothy chapter 3, at verse 13, he says this. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and good great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. God has an expectation of the elder of his church. God has an expectation for the deacons of the church. And even though we are delayed in coming to the building that we come together, we are still not to neglect being faithful to God regardless of the circumstance. That's to, the elder, that's to the elders and to the deacons. And then God says something to the teachers. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Those of you who are teachers of the word of God. He says it in verse number 2. Um, uh, uh, let me read 1 and 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from among many witnesses. Watch this. Here's that word. Commit these things to faithful men. And when he's talking about men, he's talking about men and women who will be able to teach others also. Those of us who are teachers of the word of God, we can't get lazy, we can't get lackadaisical because what we have to do is to be faithful in teaching and communicating the word of God because God's people will not know what needs to be done if we don't teach the word, but we can't teach it if we're not faithful. Then he would remind us in James chapter 3, remember, don't be many teachers. Why? Because we're going to experience the stricter judgment. Husbands. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Husbands, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7. Fellas, I know some of y'all tired. I know some of y'all exhausted. I understand. Them children get on your nerves. I get all of that. I get that. But God is still saying to us, be faithful because the Lord could return at any time. And when he returns, here's what he needs to find us doing. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, meaning with your wife with understanding. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Those of you who are wives, go to Colossians chapter 3. Verse number 18, because some of y'all kind of got it twisted. You don't run the house. 
Mm. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. What do you want the Lord to find you doing when he returns? We, we cannot just because life is not like we want it to be right now, we cannot in any way compromise our faithfulness to God. Be submissive as God has called for you to be. Single adults, you don't have no man, you don't have no woman, you don't have no husband, you don't have no wife. You have a responsibility also. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34, he says there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, or the unmarried man cares about the things of the Lord, that he or she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. If you are single, you ought to still be satisfying the Lord. Parents, we have a responsibility. We've got children that God has given us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. It's still in the Bible. It has not changed. I know the pandemic is here, but nothing about what God has said to us has changed. And you fathers, even our mothers, do not provoke your children to wrath. But watch this. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Parents, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting reports from Stefan, from, from Reverend Skinner, from the, 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 the leader of our youth, the leader of our children, that many of your children are not engaging in the videos that are designed for their learning, for their teaching. Parents, please raise up your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's not the time, y'all, to get lackadaisical, complacent, and lazy. We need to get more fervent about serving the Lord because the closer, the older we get, the closer we get to his return. And finally, this is the one for our children. They, 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 they got the least responsibility of all, but God still holds them responsible, right? Notice again what he says in his word in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, it hasn't changed. It's the same thing. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Knowing that the Lord is about to come back, knowing that he is about to return, there's only one thing for us to do, is to be faithful unto him. To do what he's called for us to do. Because he has been so good to us, he's been so kind, he's been so generous, he's been so loving, he's been so gracious beyond our ability to comprehend. He deserves our best. He deserves excellence. He deserves not settling just for doing enough. So the question is, if the Lord were to return today, if he were to return right now, what is he going to find you doing? Don't be, be the faithful servant. Don't be that servant that's saying the Lord is delaying so I can just do whatever I want, eat, drink, be merry, beat up everybody I want, fight with everybody I want, cuss them out if I feel like. He's saying, no, be faithful. Because the Lord's return is inevitable. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord ever keep you is our prayer. Uh, I want to uh, just encourage that maybe someone who's listening today who may not be saved, who hasn't trusted Jesus as your Savior, and maybe somebody who's been thinking that you're saved. Um, the reality is for brothers and sisters, um, ladies and gentlemen, that Jesus Christ died in order that we didn't have to fake anything. We didn't have to pretend to be anything because we were sinners. But he died in our place. He died in our stead so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could be redeemed from the slave market of sin where we're no longer doing what the devil wanted us to do or what our flesh wanted us to do. But now we're able to do what the Lord wants us to do. So today, if you haven't trusted in Jesus as your Savior, today is a good day. Right now is a good time. Because he could return at any moment. I'm talking about, I'm talking about any moment. He could come right now. That's, that's, how, that's how serious this is. That's how serious it is. He could come any moment. 
and, 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 the, and, the, and the church, the saints of God, uh, believed that. The early church, they believed that. They waited for his return. They were anticipating his return. They were looking forward to the return of Jesus. So if you haven't trusted him, you can't be ready. But I want to tell you today, if you trust him, you can get yourself ready today. And here is the good news about Jesus. Here's, here's the wonderful thing. That, that if you trust him today as your savior, if you trust him today as your savior, if you trust him today as your savior, if you trust him right now as your savior, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, it will all be forgiven. Mm -mm. It, it, do, it doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how, how, how many people you've maybe have reached, mistreated. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done in life. If you trust him today, if you say, if you say in your heart, you recognize that, that the only way to Jesus, the only way to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. If you will say that today, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. He was buried in the grave and that God raised him from the dead. I believe that today you can be saved. And now watch this, watch this. If the Lord were to return today, if he were to come right now, you would automatically go to heaven would be with him. Oh! Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what you may be doing right now. If you will trust Jesus as your Savior right now, right at this moment, and if he were to come in the next two minutes, you could be like that guy on the cross. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. But, 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 you know, if he lets you live longer than that, there's some things he'll expect of you, if you will, you know. But I'm just saying, today, right now, this moment, that's what salvation is, to show that all your sins are forgiven. To show again that he gives you a place in eternity uh, with the Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So if that describes you today, trust him. You might be some with someone and they can give you more information about it if that's the case. And then maybe that you want to talk to an elder of the church. Uh, our phone number to call is 713-672-9847. 713-672-9847. We'll be glad to serve you and to assist you to help you to understand a little bit more what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, ma'am, please, sir. That describes you today. Father, we love you and thank you for those who are responding to your word in a very positive way, for those who are not saved, that they might become saved. And then, Lord, for those Christians that have heard your word today, that has fallen on good ground in our hearts and in our minds, we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Won't you give God a hand praise again for his greatness, his goodness, and his extreme kindness to each and every one of us. Uh, it's offering time. It's offering time. It's offering time. It's offering time. So I would that you would prepare uh, for giving. If there's anyone in the building, our deacons can assist you. If you're not in the building, you know what you need to do. You're doing it online. And we want to again applaud and thank God again for your giving and how you've been practicing that on a regular basis, especially the members of the Good Shepherd Church. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we, are, we are so thankful that uh, so many of you that listen by way of Facebook or YouTube uh, have called us with a desire to give. We thank you all so much. That is so kind of you, and uh, we, we certainly appreciate uh, your kindness, uh, the graciousness that God has uh, shown toward you. And, and you are allowing that to be a, a gift that you give to the Good Shepherd Church. And it is certainly appreciated. And we are very, very grateful for it. So we pray again that you are giving as God has uh, commanded us to give. Amen. 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 Whatever needs to be done, we will assist. We will provide the envelopes that need it, that are needed. Amen. Shall we pause and pray just for just a moment and then we'll move forward. Father, thank you now for every giver and every gift. We pray that it was used for the ongoing of your kingdom, the magnifying of your name, and the edifying of your church. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray it. Amen. Amen. We do have some birthdays to acknowledge and I want to uh, ask us to give us a, a power clap if you would. LaShonda Davis, Patricia Davis, Jalen Jackson. Deshaun Simmons, Sherelle Stevens, and Lawrence Johnson Jr. Amen. Amen. 
Happy birthday to every one of you. Uh, we have some anniversaries. Andrew and Cynthia Freeman, 32 years. Warren and Julia Johnson, 35 years. Linton and Mary Jane Jason, 47 years. Amen. Amen. Congratulations to each and every and each and every one of you. Listen, I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an, an executive decision, an elder decision right now. I've got an assignment that I'm asking every family, every family to take. And I, and I want you to take the time that we would normally do for Sunday school to discuss it with your family. I, I, re, I really mean that. Um, we don't know when we're gonna be able to come back to this building. I know that the governor has opened up things a little bit more, but uh, I'll be honest with you, as an, as an elder, as a pastor of this church, uh, I'm more so uh, geared to what uh, our mayor is saying, uh, Mayor Turner, uh, because I do believe that Mayor Turner is uh, much closer to the situation. I think he understands the situation better than, than, than I think from a state perspective. So I don't know how long it's gonna be, but in the meantime, those things that we have put in place for Bible study, uh, we're going to be praying tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. You know, we are a membership of almost 400 or 400 people. And sometimes in our prayer time, we got 18 to 20 folk praying. Listen, I'm, 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 I'm asking you, those of you who are fathers and husbands of your house, those of you who are the women who are the heads of your particular house, I'm asking you to just take some time today and really have frank discussion with your family to, 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 to make the decisions that need to be made as it relates to our growth, our Christian growth, our personal growth as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, those opportunities that we have at Sunday school, uh, I get the reports, y'all. I, I, I'm watching, you know, I'm, I'm seeing television. I know what's happening. And some of you just are not doing it. And I'm saying that's not the way God wants us to respond to him in light of the fact that he's going to return at any moment. So I'm saying this as your pastor Bob, because I'm, I'm genuinely concerned about your soul. I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm your boss and your dictator. No, I am genuinely concerned about your soul. Uh, and, and I want you to be in a right relationship with the Lord more than anything else. I really do. So I'm asking you all to have that discussion. Uh, parents, have that discussion with your children. Uh, our, our teachers, they go out of their way to do videos for your children. Uh, they, they, you know, prepare, make those presentations. In some cases, you, some of your children are just not showing up. They, they're not. And, and if you are leaving that to your children, parents, that's, that's, not, that's not how the house is supposed to function. You have to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord of making sure, just like you're making sure that they're getting their secular education, you got to make sure that they're exposed to Christian education. And in many cases, those videos don't last long. So I'm asking you, uh, some of you have to go back home. But when you go home, don't just take the time that we normally would for Sunday school, the next 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and really have frank discussion with your family. We need to be in Sunday school. We need to attend uh, the Bible studies in the week. We need to be watching those videos, parents, for the children. Because, again, I'm getting reports, and it's not happening. So I'm saying as your pastor, out of everything that is going on in this pandemic, that is my greatest fear. That is my greatest fear, that we are disengaging from the word of God. That is my greatest fear. And so I'm saying to you, because I love y'all so much, Please, don't get lazy, don't get complacent, don't get lackadaisical, because the Lord deserves our best, because this is where we are at this particular time. Uh, to Sean, uh, to uh, Andrell, uh, I'm going to ask if you all would, if y'all haven't prepared anything, those, you all have to, y'all are going to be teaching Wednesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, uh, women don't forget, tomorrow night. Everybody's praying together at 7 o'clock. The women are meeting 7 o'clock Tuesday. The men are meeting at 7 o'clock on, on Tuesday. So let's engage in that. 
Stefan is going to give further direction. Reverend Skinner is going to give further direction in terms of uh, what our youth and our children can do. Those videos are still present for them to watch. They can still watch them. But parents, please, please, please have those conversations. Families, please have those conversations with each other so that we, so that we can put ourselves in order because we don't know how long this thing is going to be. Because here's a reminder, the Lord, the Lord is coming back. <laughs> The Lord is coming back. And what do we want to find him doing? What, what do we want him to find us doing when he returns? My prayer is that God continue to bless and keep us. So just stand together wherever we may be. Let's pray on our way out. I'm asking you to pray for, uh, her name is Josephine Diddle. This is the uh, grandmother of Andrea Ben. Uh, those of you who may not know, if you look in the uh, church directory, you will recognize who Andrea is. And, and we want to be praying for her and for her family. Uh, in terms of what they're going through. So, Father, thank you for reminding us that the Lord, that you're going to return. You're going to send your son back. We don't know when it's going to be, but we know it could be at any moment, at any hour. So, God, I pray uh, right now for those who are sick and certainly pray for Josephine Diddle who has to be placed in hospice because of her care. Her, her health is, is waning and she's getting very weak. But, Lord, we know you got the last word on everything. Uh, we're convinced, uh, we've already seen it, if you can raise up an Elvina Lafleur, uh, we know you can raise up anybody. And so we trust you, Lord, to, uh, to do what you do best, and that is just be God, uh, allow your will to be done. Uh, we certainly pray for Brother Herman Denson, who was in the hospital but has been released, and we pray you continue to bless his body and allow him to heal. We pray the same for Brother James Leonard, who's been in the hospital, that you would allow his body to recover. We pray again for Sister Chandler, Lord, who fell twice this week. And uh, thank God no bones been broken or anything. But, Lord, we see her body getting feeble. But we know again that you are great and awesome God. We ask that you would, uh, you would take care of her um, as only you are able to do. You've been doing it for 92 years, and we know you're not going to stop. So uh, we pray that you would have your way. Brother, Ly Brother Larry Henry. Pray for his recovery as he still is battling the issues that are going on with his heart. God, we know again you are the great physician. We know you are the healer. We pray for Milton RV, who is still going through his recovery from the amputation of his leg. And again, we know you got the power. So, Lord, we're entrusting, uh, we're entrusting him to you. We pray for both Clyde Berry and Clyde Jr., Lord, uh, that you continue to bless them, one with the issue of cancer. We pray for Brother Clyde as he goes through his therapy that it would not weaken him and it would not affect him too adversely. But, Lord, we know that whatever you do is always the right thing. Give him strength to endure what he is going through. We pray, God, for our children, uh, some who are struggling with the issue of the virtual learning. We pray for our teachers and administrators and the things that they're having to deal with. But, Lord, we know you got us in such a time as this for a purpose. And so I pray that you continue to help us to... Uh, to do those things that are pleasing in your sight, even though things are not like we would want them to be. We know it is well with our soul because you are so good and so kind. And so, again, we do pray for our nation. Uh, we pray again for our president. We pray for all those in Congress. We pray again for every church that is open in your name, God, that we can glorify you all throughout the world. And then we continue praying for the issue of this pandemic, Father. What we do know is that when it is gone, we will know it's gone. Uh, in the meantime, help us to be faithful to you as you've called for us to, to be. And then always help us to remember that at any moment, any day, at any time of the day, you could return. So help us now as we have this discussion with our families to re-engage re, uh, ourselves, to recommit ourselves to what you have required for us to do. Because we know one day we all got to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to be, be given... Uh, rewards for what we've done in the body, you said, whether they're good or bad. So we look forward, Lord, to you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, but come on up a little higher and I'll make you the ruler of many things. We pray these things now in Jesus' name as we leave this place. Amen. God bless you. God bless you until we meet again. Don't forget your assignment. Don't forget your assignment. Bless you. Bye-bye.